Welcome to Veterans Chronicles. I'm Greg Corumbus, honored to be joined today by U.S. Army Command Sergeant Major Brian Flom. He is a veteran of Iraq, Afghanistan, and Kosovo. And sir, it's an honor to have you with us. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Where were you born and raised, sir? I was born and raised in Los Angeles, California. And was there a history of military service in your family? Absolutely not. No, no history. So how did you join the service and why? Um, so I always had, a, uh, had, had the desire to serve my country. Um, and back in 90, 1991, if you, if you recall, Desert Storm, Desert Shield was going on, and that kind of peaked, uh, it kind of created the perfect storm. So, so that's going on. Um, I have this interest to serve my country. I had just kind of a, kind of a duty. I want to be part of something bigger than myself. And, uh, and I really had no desire to go to college. So I'm having a, uh, we'll call it a discussion, if you will, with my mom about taking the SATs. Um, wasn't really interested in taking the SATs because that was kind of the, um, you know, the, uh, the, the first step to going to college. So she says, well, why don't you join the Army or something? Um, I said, oh, maybe, maybe I will. And, uh, and, and that day I called the recruiter, and, and here I am uh, over 28 years later. So where did you do your training? I did my training at Fort McClellan, Alabama. I did uh, um, what they call one station unit training. So I attended basic training and military police advanced training there. So MP was the, the main place you were yes. focused at first? Okay. You served during the uh, operation in Kosovo. Were you on the ground there? I was, yeah. And what were you doing there? Yeah, so we did uh, peacekeeping missions, training the, uh, you know, training the local police to uh, um, uh, be self, self-sufficient. Um, take care of himself and police the local populace, and then just kind of make sure everything was okay. Well, that was a good dry run for the policing operations that would come later on down the line. Ultimately, you then also served in both Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, when were those tours? Yeah, so the, the Afghanistan tour was actually very brief. Um, that was in 2002 when I was part of the mission to take the um, detainees from Afghanistan to Guantanamo Bay. Um, so it really was just a touching the ground and, and, and taking off again um, on, on a plane. And then I served in 2003, 2004, 2005, um, 2007 in Iraq. Four tours. Well, three, three, tours, three tours, but it just it, it continued on. So 03 to 04, gotcha. um, all of, pretty much all of 2005, and then 2007 till uh, 2008, and all in Iraq. Real quick, anything uh, stand out on that uh, flight back to Gitmo with the with the detainees? Did they put up a fuss? Or the absolutely interact? not, absolutely not. It was a it was very calm, um, very professional, and uh, just very long, very long time to to spend on a plane. Probably uh, you know when all said done, about twenty three hours. Um, but no, it was nothing exciting to, to tell that story. Well, let's move to. I guess the last tour in Iraq, 2007, which is a major part of your story, when you were severely injured, where was your unit? What were you doing when this all happened? Yeah, sure. So uh, it was 2007, October 10th of, of 2007, and we were stationed in Baghdad, Iraq, um, and uh, you know, been on numerous combat patrols in years prior. But uh, that that evening, all I was doing was trying to go get dinner. Um, and, uh, and, and on our way to, to, to get dinner, I was with my, with my company commander. I was the first sergeant of a company at the time. Uh, heard, uh, heard the alarm for incoming rounds, and uh, um, we, took, we took rockets that evening. Um, so unfortunately, two were killed that evening, and about 30 of us were, were injured um, to varying degrees. And you were quite severely injured. Uh, did you know right away how significant they were? Um, I did not know right away. So it... It knocked me unconscious, um, and when I came to, I said to my commander, I think I was hit, and we worked our way to the bunker because rounds were still coming in, um, and it wasn't until I kept advancing medical stations that they were kind of telling me how, how significant my, my injuries were at the time. And so you injured your head, your throat, your neck, yeah. and your jaw. Right. Did I miss anything? Right. No. It was one shot. Um, it took, uh, I, took, I took shrapnel from the rocket attack. And, it, and it, so it broke my upper, upper jaw, um, went through, and it cut my throat on the inside. And we wouldn't know that until later. Um, and then it lodged in the back of my neck, um, very, very close to my carotid artery. So every, that's why every doctor would come in and say, hey, you should play the lottery. Because, you know, any other change to the uh, trajectory of that, of that shrapnel, and we'd have a different outcome today. So what did they do with you once they established the severity of the injuries? So it, it took them a little while to, to figure out what was going on, and it, it actually... Not to, uh, not to add to it, but it wasn't until my stomach filled up with blood, and eventually it was that blood had to come out. Um, and that's when we realized that there was a lot more going on in, inside than, than we initially thought. So they just kept advancing me to treatment facilities, um, to another more advanced treatment facility in, in Iraq. Um, eventually I went to Germany. 
um, came out to uh, to um, Andrews Air Force Base for a, for a night and uh, was able to work my way down to uh, San Antonio, Texas at Brooke Army Medical Center, um, which was only about two hours, two and a half hours south of where my family was located. I was stationed at Fort Hood, Texas at the time. And we'll talk about Brooke in, in just a second. One of the things I read uh, in, in discussing the injuries was the intense pain, particularly with the jaw injury. How would you describe the intensity of that pain? Yeah, I mean, it was just, you know, it was it was difficult to eat if I wanted to try and get anything solid, which really considered like, like macaroon, you know, or uh, scrambled eggs. I um, had to kind of to just shove it in there because the whole, you know, the, the, the whole upper mandible was shattered. All the, the muscle there was, was gone, and I just, I could not open it, couldn't talk as I, as I thought, as you know, as I am now. Um, so, so definitely painful experience. And then what was the protocol at, at Brook Army Medical Center in San Antonio? What did they do for you there? Um, they really checked me out a lot. Um, but there wasn't much you could do. You can kind of let it heal. I didn't require any surgery. They made sure I had, had medications to uh, to kind of heal the wound. So it's it's very hard to see now. Um, if you would have seen it back at the at the time, you know, my mouth hung to the to the side. You could see where the where the muscles were damaged, and and and, uh, and I kind of thought that's how it was going to be for the rest of my life, which I was fine with. Um, you know, was what is that? A real big dimple from where the shrapnel went, but it just um, you know it, it really healed well. Um, so so most people, unless I point it out, they have they have no idea. How long did it take for your mouth essentially to function normally and the rest of it? Um, yeah, I don't, I, I don't really know what that, like if I woke up one day and I said, ah, oh, my mouth is fine. Um, you know, so I spent about six weeks recovering medically um, from the physical aspect, but, but mentally I knew I had to get back to my, to my unit. The first words I remember is when I was in the hospital, General Petraeus pinned the Purple Heart on me when I was in the hospital, and, and the first words I, I told him was, hey, sir, I'm going back. You know, and then, uh, um, you know, exactly what my wife wanted to hear, told her the same thing. I called her up, and first thing I said was, hey, how are you doing? And, and she's like, how am I doing? How are you doing? And I said, fine, I'm going back to my unit. Um, and she'll still remind me of that to, to this day. But uh, so, so, so physically, I, I don't know. I know I was back in Iraq and still trying to recover um, with, my, you know, just the, the tightness of my jaw and the pain. But, uh, but, but mentally, that was the best place for me was to get back to, to my soldiers that I left behind. How long of a span? What, six weeks, you said? About six weeks. That's a pretty quick return. Right. I, I think I was determined, right? I, I was determined. Um, and it was interesting. You know, and everybody, every step I went, and, and, you know, but I became concerned because the further away I got from my, from my unit, the, the more concerned, like, I'm not going to make it back, right? And then when they came in and said, hey, we're, we're, you know, we're, we're shipping you out to the States. This was in Germany, like on a Sunday morning. I was like, no, you're not. I want to see my, my doctor. I need to go back to my unit. I can't go back to the, back to the States. And, uh, they were uh, less interested in hearing that, and, uh, and and off I went. So, so the, so the six weeks was just really me fighting every every step of the way, and and doing some persuading to the doctors to say, hey, I'm okay. I need to I need to get back because that just in my heart that's where I belonged. Talk about that a little bit more because uh, I think the the connection with the other guys, your devotion to the mission, a lot of people would, if they're not uh, from a military culture, might think. I really got lucky. I almost had my carotid artery severed. I got a family. Uh, all these other things that could be rationalized to be, okay, it's time to do something else now. You and so many others I've talked to are saying, no, 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 it's the mission and the guys that, yeah. that I've promised to be with. Yeah, there is no other option in my opinion. Right? I, you know, if, if I could get the doctors to clear me medically to, to get out of there um, and go talk to our, uh, our commander who was in charge of my, my unit back at, back at Fort Hood and, and get him to authorize to send me back, I was going. And I mean, I spoke of my original desire to, to enter the Army because I had a sense of duty. Well, now there wasn't a sense. It was a complete duty, a complete obligation to go continue to serve my country. And, uh, and, and really, I felt responsible for the 160 soldiers I had um, still in, in harm's way. And I needed to be with them, and, and I needed to show them that hey, we, can, uh, we can figure this out. And it, was, it wasn't an option for me. What was it like to be back? Was it exactly what you thought it would be? Like the, the feeling and, and the, the drive? Did you, once you got back, were you like, this is exactly where I need to be right now? Um, it's it's easy to second guess yourself when you when you when you get back there because you're now you're back in this environment you know when you're home in the you know, you're in a hospital bed you feel kind of safe, um, but when you get back the you know the, the enemy doesn't pause and say okay let me bring you back in let's take it easy let's let's kind of figure this out um, 
you know, so, and, and I jumped right in and, and, and on the outside, you know, I had to, to, to you know, to, to show the team that, uh, you know, I'm ready to go. But on the inside, it was, uh, it was scary. It was, it was hard because you have those associations. You have, you know, you hear the alarm go, you know, going off to, to symbolize, you know, incoming, um, you know, you know, rockets or incoming rounds. Um, you know, you hear the guns going off, trying to intercept them in, in the sky, and immediately you're, you're brought back to, you know, or I was brought back to that, that uh, evening of October the 10th. So your superiors didn't ease you back in, it sounds like. they. Once you were back, you were back. Yeah, there was no time for that. Yeah, yeah. You know, the, the show was going on. My, my soldiers hadn't stopped. I mean, that's how we're, we're kind of, you know, that's what's ingrained in us in the, in the Army and, and, and as soldiers is, you know, when, when, when somebody goes down, the next guy's got to stand up regardless of the, of the circumstances and how tough it is. And, and you know, uh, my soldiers did that, and, and I was happy to continue to, to lead them in combat and uh, come home with them the following year. And this is in the midst of the surge, 2007, right? Yeah, which um, was an interesting dynamic. So if you go back to 2000, in 2007, I deployed with a different unit when I went, originally went over there and I was working in, in uh, intelligence at our headquarters battalion. Um, so this is March of 2007. Um, they bring me in, you know, they call me in. My, our, my, my sergeant major at the time calls me and says, hey, we want to make you a first sergeant of a company, and that was my dream to be to be a company first sergeant. You know, 160 soldiers in a in a, in a combat zone. Um, I was like, yeah, sign me up. And he's like, well, they're three months off cycle, so you're going to have to do 15 months over here um, to do this. And I said, oh, I better call my wife and ask her what she thinks. So I called her, and she kind of said, you already know the answer to this question. I'm not sure why you're calling me. I said, I know, but you know, make me feel better. It's courteous. Um, right, right. You know, <laughs> trying to be considerate. Um, so I, you know, of course, we agreed that I was gonna, that that's what I was gonna do. And I went back and I told the sergeant major, I'm in, you know, put me in coach. And uh, so that's 15 months. Well, now the surge hits. So 15 months, so the unit that I was gonna go take was over there three months later from when I originally went for their 15 month tour, which meant I was gonna do 18 months over there, right? So if you really look at, minus the time I was injured, I deployed in March of 2007 and I came home in August of 2008. That's a long time. Brian, let's pause right there. We'll be right back with much more of your story on Veterans Chronicles. Sure. Welcome back to Veterans Chronicles. I'm Greg Corumbus, honored to be joined today by U.S. Army Command Sergeant Major Brian Flom, veteran of Iraq, Afghanistan, and Kosovo. We're talking about his injury back in 2007 and his remarkably quick return, all things considered, to his unit. Um, and, and now we're talking about how long his, um, his tour ended up being as a result of, of the surge. Brian, at what point did, did you, your wife, some other person in the military suspect you might be dealing with uh, post-traumatic stress? Um, yeah, I don't know what the, what, what the day was. So, you know, so, so I'm, you know, we'll back up to my tour in Iraq. Sure. And I'm, uh, I'm, I'm sitting in the, in the, uh, um, the dine facility one day, we call it the chow hall, and I'm, and I'm sitting there having lunch with my, with my commander. And on the TV is the Boston Marathon. Right? So I'm already, I've gone back, I was injured, I've gone back, and we're watching the Boston Marathon on TV. And if you ever watch a marathon, any sporting event such as that on, on TV, they don't show guys like me out there running the marathon, right? It's these, it's these guys who are running really fast and making it look effortlessly. I mean, they're running 26 miles at a pace I couldn't sprint for 10 feet, right? Um, you know, so I'm watching, this, uh, I'm watching this marathon, and I said to him, I said, we should do that. You know, we should run a marathon, and he looks at me like I'm crazy. And I said, no, I'm serious. Let's, let's figure this out. Let's get a team together. Let's kind of have a goal. And let's run a marathon together. And uh, he was like, okay, why not? <laughs> so we, uh, we, we got online and we researched. And we decided we would run the, San, the uh, inaugural rock and roll marathon in San Antonio. Um, so now that's 2008. Um, get a team together. We have about 15 soldiers from my unit who they're in. I mean, we opened it up to everybody. We had shirts made. We were, we were pretty excited. Um, so we come back from, from Iraq. The race was in November of 2008. We come back in August. Um, and I really had a great purpose, right? You, you came back, so the transition was, was kind of easy. I was really busy. I was, you know, I was happy to see my family. Um, but ironically, I wanted to be back in, in Iraq for, for some reason. You think you want to be home, but I, you know, I wanted nothing more than to have my, my company back um, in, in a combat zone. And I'm not sure, not sure why you kind of had the control in your own little environment. And here, now I'm back and I'm dealing with... Um, some discipline issues that are that are occurring within the organization all over the place, and I have no control of them. I don't have them 24-7. I don't have that same captive audience. But we still have our program going, and we're all training. We're meeting Saturday mornings. We're running from one city to another, and then we'd have breakfast, and our spouses would, would stop and pick us up. Um, and we do, the, we do the marathon. And what I didn't realize at the time was what that was doing for me. 
um, and, and the benefits it was having on my mind until the marathon was done and I kind of quickly went off of a cliff. Um, became more irritable. I had a much greater desire to go back to a combat zone. That's really where I even, even more did I feel like I, I belong and, and that kind of carried on. Um, my wife started prodding me and she's like, I think you need to go see somebody and you need to go get some help. Um, so I started exploring different uh, behavioral health providers, different psychiatrists, psychologists, and, and it wasn't, nothing was working for me. Um, you know, and everything, and, and, and the experience I was having was ranging from somebody wouldn't even look me in the eye, it was just, I was nothing more than a checklist on a computer to people that were really interested in, in trying to figure this out, but just couldn't. And I think I needed to kind of figure this out for myself. Um, so I'm not sure what was going to come in, but they started giving me a lot of medication, um, trying to give things for my mind, help me, help me sleep. Um, you know, telling me things like, "Oh, you're gonna, you know, this is gonna give you different side effects. You know, this is gonna help you sleep, but you may feel restless." Okay, that's <laughs> perfect, right? Interesting combination. Yeah, yeah, perfect. Um, they said, "Hey, take this one, but you may find yourself, uh, you know, but it may cause you to sleepwalk. So if you find yourself in the in the, in the grocery store um, in your pajamas, you'll know what's, you know, that something went wrong." So then, you know, I went to Walmart, and I'm like, "Man, everybody's on the same medication as me." <laughs> um, you know, so uh, trying trying different medications, and, and and one night I I really wanted to sleep. I was really tired, and I really wanted to, to sleep, and. Uh, you know, so it took probably a few extra of my, my pills. It was like, maybe those just give me a, a solid night um, sleep. And uh, didn't get up for work the next day, um, which is unknown. I'm a very timely person, very punctual. Um, and I didn't wake up for, for work. And I got a phone call from my, uh, I was still a first sergeant at the time, got a phone call from, the, from my sergeant major. And I think I finally picked up about, about 1030 that, that morning. And he says, are you okay? I said, yeah, I'm fine. Why? He's like, do you know what time it is? Nope. No idea, and, and looked, and, and it was 10:30, and that was the last day I ever took a pill. Um, but it was really just trying to. I mean, it, it, was, it was a it was it was a tough period back, back um, you know, dur during that time, and, and and somewhere right around in you know in, in that same time period, my wife says she comes to me and she says, you know, you've always enjoyed riding bicycles. Why don't you, uh, you know, why don't we go get bikes again, get mountain bikes, and let's get back on the, on, on the bike, and. So I was like, okay, you can give me an excuse to go buy a bike. So let's go. I, I was in, and, and we went and got bikes, and we started riding, a, you know, together. Um, and that's where I kind of, kind of saw um, it's this physical activity was having such a positive impact on my mind. It wasn't the medication; um, it was just being being active is really where I saw the benefits. And I said, okay, I have something going on here, and really just started kind of working. And through the support of my wife and support of some close friends um, and support of people at, at work, I kind of said, hey. I've got to take care of myself a little bit here too. Because, you know, I was a leader at the time of a, again of a, of a company, um, and my sole focus was taking care of my soldiers even back home. You know, getting them the help they needed. Um, you know, dealing with the demons that they were going through, and and seeing them at the hospital after suicide attempts on a you know at, at three in the morning on a on a Sunday morning. Um, but I was just I was trying to take in all of their pains and was, I wasn't looking at, my, at myself. So I don't know if there was a, a single event, but if I look back now, I look at that period. Um, wasn't a good time in, in, in my life and I wasn't taking care of myself. Brian, we're going to take another quick break. We'll be right back with the rest of your story on Veterans Chronicles. This is Veterans Chronicles. I'm Greg Corumbus, honored to be joined today by U.S. Army Command Sergeant Major Brian Flom, veteran of Afghanistan, Iraq, and Kosovo. And we've been talking about uh, his injury and then dealing with post traumatic stress. And uh, Brian, we we're just talking about how the medication wasn't doing it for you and getting back into uh, intense physical activity seem to be making a big difference. What do you think it is? Is it just the fact that you're active? Is it uh, a competitive aspect to it? Uh, what is it about endurance sports or any type of uh, activity, whether it's marathon or on the bike, that, yeah. that, 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 that gets you focused in the right way? So it's not the competitive aspect because uh, there's no, you know, I, I tell people I'm not a, I'm not a competitor. I'm a completer, um, you know. So when I when I go when I go do these events, um, it's really just just being out and and it's something that just it clicks in the mind. And I don't know if I can, you know, how I can describe it, but I, you know, but I but I tell folks now, and I even tell them now, I was, I was like, the best form of of, of you know uh, you know preventive medicine for your for your mind is being physically active. You know, I was like, start your day off. I said whatever it may be, it doesn't have to be a long bike ride. It doesn't have to be a, a, a marathon, um, you know, go walk for 30 minutes, just something to kind of, you know, get you going and, and, and just 
whatever the, the effect is that, that it has on my mind. And, and I think studies are even starting to show that, um, you know, the benefits of physical activity on their mind are, are just, uh, you know, they're, they're great. What changes did you see at home and at, at work? Um, so I got my, I got my wife on, on the bike. You know, I mentioned that earlier. Yeah. Um, uh, she won't ride bikes with me anymore since she's not in this room. Just know that my version's the correct version of why she doesn't ride, and I tell the truth. So she, may, you know, if she were with me, she would uh, blame me as, as the reason she doesn't ride. But uh, it just, I started to see, and it wasn't just the, the activity, right? There was so much more um, that, that goes on with it, but it just kind of, I don't know, I was just, I was just more relaxed. I was less intense. Um, and I can even to this day, I can tell, you know, if I start to get a little uptight, my wife has said, Hey, go ride your bike, go for a run, go to the gym or, or something like that. So it's just, that's what works for me personally. It doesn't, it's not going to work for, for everybody. Um, but as I started to see the benefits, I was, I was carrying that to, you know, at, at work too. And I, and I, cause I started to see, especially as we talked, the, the stigma of seeking, uh, um, mental health treatment. A lot of folks in the military are concerned with this will impact my career, this could impact my security clearance, um, so on and so forth. So, you know, if I flash forward to, to this day, this whole experience has really given me a platform to stand up and say, hey, you know, be proactive, you know, go seek that help, that help you that you need. I'll go with you if you want, but I want you to seek that and continue to be a productive member of, of our organization um, before something happens in your life where we have to get you that help and, and that changes things. How much of a change and a change for the better have you noticed over the past decade plus on that? Because literally the person I interviewed before, you said his instinct as well was that I'm supposed to be stoic. I'm supposed to be able to carry this. It's, yeah. it's a sign of weakness if, if you don't. So yeah. that seemed to be the common instinct then, or at least it was for him. Sure. Um, now, is, is there less of a stigma on that? Absolutely. Absolutely. We've, we've come leaps and bounds on, on, on getting over the... Uh, and I'm not even sure there was ever as much of a stigma um, as there was just a you know, I mean, a different mindset, right? We didn't recognize the, the benefits of, of, the, uh, of the mind on human performance and what we ask of, of, of the soldiers to do. So I think that we've just, we've really evolved over time. And the people like myself, if I go back, you know, 12 years, 11 years, um, who was that younger soldier in the military trying to navigate the, and get that, that help that I needed and, and seeing how beneficial it was for me, now I'm the senior guy in the in the army, and uh, and I can stand up and speak with credibility and say, "Hey, I've been where you where you you know where you are right now, um, and I'll go I'll do this with you, and we'll do this together, and then we'll come to work together, and nobody will have to know." And and I've had folks come up to me, and I think that's you know. So how do you measure success in something like that? Um, because it's hard to measure the unknown. It's hard to say like who's going to get the help that they need that maybe they wouldn't have. But it's when folks come into my office, or they send me an email, or they send me a text and said. Hey, Sergeant Major, you were you were right. I needed this help, and you know, just hearing you say that was refreshing. And and I'm going now, you know. And it's just between them and I. Nobody will ever, nobody ever knows, and uh, and that makes me feel good. Was there ever a, a, a real threat of people losing, like you said before, security clearance or opportunity for promotion if they were to admit it? It's, it sounds like it's much better now in that. Yeah, I don't. I don't think I never perceived a, a threat of promote. You know, impacts. You know, adverse impacts to promotion or adverse impacts. It just never, you know, an experience. Can I speak for everybody in the in the, in the military? No. And, and you know, yeah. do we have some who may not be getting it right? Probably so, yeah. right? But that's just that's the human, um, you know, aspect of it. But but I've never felt um, that that I was being, uh, you know, held back or something was, you know, adversely impacting my career be, because of it. Um, you know, where I think we needed to work, you know, and we're still working is to create. Environment. So we talk about going to get help, and they want to send you. So they sent me to group therapy, for example. Here I am, a first sergeant, right, a senior non-commissioned officer in the Army, and I'm sitting next to a private in that same group therapy. Well, that doesn't work very well, you know, both ways, right? So that private's not comfortable sitting next to a first sergeant. Now I'm a, I'm a first sergeant sitting next to a, a private. Maybe there's a time and a place for that, but it uh, certainly wasn't at the, at the beginning of, of us trying to get some, get some help. So, uh, but, but I think we've starting to break that out we can get those little you know those true peer-to-peer connections and then go back out and tell our story and tell those privates like hey you know you guys help each other but i'm going to help you too so the process has been refined absolutely i think we're we we, we've come we've we're 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 doing good and there's always we can always get better um but we're, we're doing good all right so you're a runner and you're a biker yeah that's two things you have in common with the former president of the United States. Right. So how did you get to meet George W. Bush? Sure. So um, 
Actually, I was in the I was in the middle of a field training exercise in in Kansas at, at the time, um, and I get an email one day from a friend of mine. He says, "Hey, you know, I know you like to mountain bike. Um, there's this opportunity to to uh, go mountain biking with the with the former president. Uh, here's the link. Do the application." I was like, "Okay, I'll do the application." So I fill it all out and and send it off and kind of forget about it. And I was like, "All right, I'm you know probably one of." I don't know, man, you know, thousands that are, that are applying to, to something like that. And, and I get a call, it's a Friday night, and, you know, you know, ironically, I've come back from the field. I'm at, I'm at home, I'm down in the basement, and it's a Friday night, I, I get a call, and I, but it's, it comes from, from Texas, and I don't recognize the number. And I just have this habit sometimes, if I don't recognize the number, they'll leave a message. Because, you know, maybe it's somebody trying to sell me something. Right. Um, and then it, it goes, and, and it goes to voicemail, and I'm, there I'm thinking, like, Maybe I should have answered this. Maybe this is, you know, is the call I'm waiting for, um, you know, perhaps just a pipe dream. So I play the answer, you know, I play the voicemail because then they did leave a voicemail and it says, hey, this is, you know, so-and-so from the, from the Bush Institute. Please give us a call back. And, and, and I, you know, so I'm still sitting down in my basement um, and, uh, and, and uh, call them back. And they're like, hey, congratulations. Are you still interested in, you know, coming to mountain bike with, uh, with President Bush? And I'm like, absolutely. And, you know, and they're giving me the details or telling me I get to bring somebody. So I'm like, oh, great. My wife gets to come with me. Um, so we hang up the phone and I go running up upstairs. Um, I slip running up the stairs and slide back down, <laughs> go back up. And I, and I tell her and I said, guess what? We're, we've been selected. We're going. Um, and guess what else? You get to go with me. And so she's all, all excited about that. And uh, still no idea what to what to expect going into this ride in, in uh, 15. Um, I'm thinking, all right, maybe this will be a big group. I'll just be one in a in a huge crowd. Will be you know be some huge peloton or something like that. We'll be riding and nobody will know. And uh, had no idea how intimate of a of a ride this would be. Um, and just what a what a, what a life changer it's been since then. What was it like? Um, once you actually yeah, got down there, it's so it's it's hard to describe. It's so surreal. You're like, here I am, right? You know, how, you know, one, how did I get so lucky? Why why me? Because there's there's I mean, there's millions of veterans out there, and they all have such great stories to tell and and, and such neat experiences. Um, but now as one of 17 that you know that weekend to go to go ride with him and to really connect with the former president and and to see, um, you know. You could tell he wasn't doing this because he f he felt he had to. He was doing this because he wanted to. He enjoyed riding bikes, and he wanted to, you know, he wanted to give back. He wanted to connect with with, with his veterans, and uh, I mean, it was just an amazing, absolutely amazing experience. Um, not just riding with the, with the president, but meeting people like you had Kevin in here, you know, previously, who you know I've, I've, I've met as well. Um, connecting with those folks. So I have friends now because of Team 43 all over the world that I would never would have met them in any other circumstance. And, uh, and, and, and a lot of us are pretty close and stay in touch to this day. Did he talk much about the decision to go to war? Uh, obviously, that would be a, a decision that would weigh on any president. And then he sees the people that the decision impacts, of course. So did that come up at all? Or was it more of uh, just a chance to get to know each other and to... Uh, get out there on the bike. Yeah, I think more getting to, to know each other. I'm not, I'm not sure. I mean, I, I asked him one day, I, you, know, I, you know, I was like, Mr. President, what does this do for you? So I understand that you want to bring, you know, you know people that you basically set, sent to combat. Um, you want to bring them in and try and connect and get to know some of them. But what, is it, what does this, this do for you? And I think it's, you know, equally beneficial, I, I would submit. Um, you know, us going to the president's ranch and, and riding bikes with him, but him having us, you know, people that would be nothing but a name or a number, I mean, that, that he would never know to provide that connection and to really get to know who, uh, who the service members are of, of the United States. And he painted your portrait? He did. He did, yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, that was exciting. How'd you learn about that? <laughs> so I got an email one day, and I'm not sure if people are telling the, the, the same story. Um, so I knew that when he came out of office, he took up painting. But I got an email one day saying, hey, the president's painted you. Um, please sign this waiver. I was like, well, I don't really know what that means, but the president's painted me, so I'll sign the waiver. And I, and I signed it and, and, and sent it off. And then you just kind of started to see, um, you know, more and more information and really, you know, the, the full information eventually came out saying, hey, you know, this is what he did. He's done murals. He's done individual paintings. Um, I have, I'm on one of the, one of the murals, but, uh, yeah, that was, that was neat. And now you're included in the book. I am. What do you think that does for veterans, not just the ones in the book, but the ones who see the book? Um... I think not just for, for, for veterans, I think for, for everyone that, uh, you know, who, who sees that, that book or sees the, you know, the exhibit here, um, it just, it, it puts, a, it puts a story, it puts, 
you know, it puts a face, it puts a name to the history of our of our country um, that maybe people won't don't necessarily appreciate in the presence, but you know, in the present, but in the future, we'll certainly certainly get it, and it, and it provides a connection. Um, and I mean, years to come, people will read this and say, "Hey, these were the people who went b- before us." What's your advice to folks who were in your position, um, not feeling right, and whatever they're doing isn't getting it done? Like whether maybe they're still dealing with medication that's not yeah. having the desired effect. Um, what do you tell them? Yeah, I tell them, uh, don't give up. Right, keep keep trying. Um, you know, just as I went through a myriad of of mental health providers. Um, if I would have, you know, based my entire experience of seeking mental health treatment on the first person I experienced, who knows where I'd be today? Um, you know, but I just kept going and I tell them to, you know, play, you know, figure out different combinations. Maybe it's medication, maybe it's talking to somebody, maybe it's, it's exercise, but figure out what works for you. And, uh, and there's no shame in it, right? You know, just, you know, continue to be a productive member of society and continue to, to work through it and, and, uh, you know, Everything's not great. Everything's not great with me. I don't have, you know, always a great day. I mean, I drive down the freeway and I'll have a thought sometimes and for no reason I start crying and it's not because of the traffic here in D.C., although that makes me want to cry as well sometimes. But, uh, you know, it's just I kind of go off in my own little world and uh, and I have my bad days, you know, to, to this day and I'm sure I'll continue to have them. But, uh, you know, I don't let that, that define me. I kind of, you know, grab myself and, all right, tomorrow's a new day. You just mentioned two things that I think are really important in this context. Number one is that there's not a one-size-fits-all treatment or solution to this. Right. And then the other is that even when you do kind of figure out what works for you, it's not a endless upward climb. There's going to be, or could be, uh, valleys or, or setbacks, and it's, it's an ongoing process. It's not, okay, I'm fixed. Yeah. Yeah, and, and you know, and you have to figure out multiple avenues. So I enjoy physical activity, but you know, let's say knock on wood, I would I'd break my leg, and now I can't be physical any, anymore, right? Because I have to sit there and recover. So what am I going to do? Well, I, you know, it would be easy to kind of wallow in your in your sorrows there and start to go, you know, on that express train to Pity City, as I like to call it, um, or I figure out something else that that keeps my mind occupied and, and and continue to work through it and know that you know one day I'll be back out on my bike or back out running, and you know, I just. I encourage everybody to kind of, you know, figure this out for themselves, talk to people who have been through it, you know, and be open to new ideas. Now, where we left off in the story, you were, you were a first sergeant. Now, obviously, you're a command sergeant major. Right. So now how many people are you responsible for, and what are your regular duties? Yeah, so I'm responsible for about 5,000 uh, people um, in about 140 locations worldwide. Um, I'm the command sergeant major of the Army's Criminal Investigation Command. Um, which for those who don't who don't know what that is, I tell them that we're like NCIS, but we have no TV show. That's basically <laughs> what we do what we do for the Army. And then I also, uh, you know, the Army's got a great sense of humor, and they've made me the command sergeant major of the Army Corrections Command. So all the prisons in the Army are also mine. <laughs> you, know? Um, you know, so I really spend spend my time though as you know as the senior um, enlisted leader of that organization. I, I really spend my time, uh, you know, making sure that. That the, that the folks on the team um, are trained and manned and equipped to do what what the army needs them to do, and and uh, you know, and some of that is their is their mental health as well, and, and taking care of themselves, and and you know, keeping them physically and mentally in, into the game to do what they're trained to do. You mentioned you've got 28 years in uniform now. What's your goal? I go. I'll do. Uh, I, I think my goal will be 30 years, and then uh, we'll see what the next chapter of my life brings brings about. Fantastic. Brian, it's been an honor to meet you, and thank you for your time, and thank you for your service to our country. Yeah, thank you for having me. U.S. Army Command Sergeant Major Brian Flom, veteran of Iraq, Afghanistan, and Kosovo. I'm Greg Corumbus, reporting for Veterans Chronicles. Mm-hmm.